Well, good morning and welcome. I'm so glad you've joined with us as we continue our study in the book of Acts together. First, let me apologize for not having a video out last week uh, with the ice storm and the power outages and the cleanup and everything that was going on in our community, as you can imagine. It just did not come together. And so uh, we miss being with you, but we're so grateful that we can connect this way uh, this morning uh, on Sunday, March the 5th, 2023. Well, as we begin, uh, I'd like to highlight two things for you. Uh, first, uh, beginning March 20th, uh, I will be taking a three-month sabbatical leave. So from March 20th until June 20th, I will be off in a way and I'll be studying and praying and resting and reflecting and all those kinds of things. And uh, I'll miss you. I'll be praying for you as I'm away. But uh, during that time, Pastor Marty will continue with our series in the book of Acts. And as the weeks that he's preaching, he will continue to provide these uh, videos for you. Uh, there will be six of those Sundays while I'm away where we have guest preachers. Uh, we have uh, two of our missionaries are home and they will be here to preach on different occasions. And I also have four friends from Friends in Ministry who are going to come and share the word here with our church family. And on those weeks, we will not be able to provide a video for you. But we encourage you, if, if you're in the Essex County, in the Harrow area, we'd love to have you come and join with, with us in person at 10 o'clock on Sundays. And uh, that might be an opportunity for you to consider uh, making that trip in uh, on those days. Well, I'd also like to remind you or introduce to you the fact that on uh, Wednesday, March 22nd, for six consecutive Wednesday nights, we will be offering a course here at the church. That course is called uh, Smart Money, Smart Kids. Uh, one of our members will be leading that. He's a licensed uh, counselor with uh, the Dave Ramsey uh, organization uh, dealing with finances. And this is a course for parents and grandparents. And this course will teach us the basic biblical foundational uh, principles of managing our money well. How do we do that in today's world with all the financial pressures we're facing? How do we do that? And importantly, very importantly, how do we communicate that to our children? How do we teach our children starting very young? How do we train them up so that they understand how to make their money work for them, not become a slave to their money and debt and all those kind of things. And so we want to give them those skills. And uh, to do that, we want to equip parents and grandparents to pass that on. So we'll be having a, a study for those six weeks uh, for parents and grandparents. Come on out. We'd love to have you here. Bring your friends. Uh, at the same time, there will also be a children's program here at that time. And they will be introduced to those same concepts during that time, as well as have some games and other activities for the children. So phone the church office. It's important that you register for that course. And we need to be ready to have you here. So we'd love to have you register and uh, be with us. Check out more information on Facebook and our website. We'd love to have you uh, participate. Well, let's open in prayer. And then we'll turn uh, our attention to the Word of God together this morning. Father, we are so grateful uh, to be yours, to belong to you and to belong to each other as a church family as brothers and sisters in Christ. And as we call out to you this morning, we want to honor you and praise you and, and worship you for who you are. We want to give you the honor that you alone are due. We want to do that by, by honoring you with our words, our interactions with each other, the conduct of our lives, and by our response to your word. And so we thank you for your word and for your spirit. And we pray that you would deliver your word clearly to our hearts and our lives today. And as you shape us and, and shape our thinking and equip us for living your way here and now and, and equip us for reaching others, uh, we pray that this would be a, an important part of that process this morning uh, during this time in your word. And Father, we pray for uh, those that are dealing with illness, those that are dealing with grief and loss, uh, financial struggles, decisions, personal decisions, people that are looking for work, all kinds of things that are going on in our community. And yet through it all, we know that your hand is at work. We're seeing you work in hearts and lives and in individuals and in families, and we are so grateful for that. And we pray that that would continue. And we pray that this morning, this time in your word, would be a, a part of that process as you continue your work in us and through us. And we commit this time of study to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it will be spring soon. Spring is just around the corner. And one of the ways we know that is because baseball has started. And uh, maybe you're excited about that, maybe you're not. But I am, and baseball has started. And this year with baseball, there are a number of rule changes to the game. 
And so that's going to lead to some interesting moments. It will take some time to adjust to those new rules, to learn them and, and, and figure out what that looks like day to day as they play the game. And sorting it all out will take some time. It'll take some time for the players and the coaches, for the umpires and the broadcasters, and yes, the fans, as we all wrap our heads around what's this like and what are we allowed to do and not do and all those kinds of things now. And so in that process, I am sure that there will be moments of confusion. And there's also a possibility of, of conflict arising as disagreements come over that their understanding of the new rules and, and what that looks like. Well, in the first century, the early ch with the early church, things had changed. The rules had changed. Things had changed greatly as the plan of God continued to unfold it, to con continue to unfold with the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, with the arrival of the Spirit and the start of the church and all of these things, what the followers of Jesus needed together was they needed clarity and unity on the essentials. They needed clarity and unity on the essentials. And we get a great example of that in Acts chapter 15, and that's the passage we'll be in this morning. And what we'll find in this a particular passage are two principles, at least, that stand out and uh, as, as just critical for us in our thinking, in our living, as we serve and worship together here as God's people in Har Harrow in 2023. So turn with me, if you will, take your Bible and turn to Acts chapter 15, and we'll begin uh, reading in verse 1. Acts chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. But some men came down from Judea, and we're teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So, being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to, con together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up. And said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. So what happened here is we had a problem. And the first issue that we need to wrap our heads around to solve those problems is to understand the gospel. Paul and Barnabas were now back in Antioch in Syria. And they were there reconnecting with the church, the disciples that had been made there, and, and they're involved in ministry there. And the problem came up because some Jewish followers of Jesus from Judea came up to Antioch and they're teaching, according to verse 1, that unless, so this is very limiting, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Unless you do this, you cannot be saved. This is a gospel issue. And this is what they were saying about the gospel. When, when Paul and Barnabas get back to Jerusalem and they start talking, there's some followers of Jesus now who were Pharisees who they stood up and said, it's necessary. It's necessary. Has to happen. It is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. They must be required to do these things. So in Antioch and in Jerusalem, this is being stirred up, this confusion about the gospel. How are we saved? Is it Jesus and the law of Moses? What is it? And so the Mosaic law is now being imposed on Gentile believers. And that's leading to disunity. Look at the wording in verse 2. After Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them. There's disunity here. There's confusion and conflict. 
Are we turning people into Jews or are we introducing people to Jesus Christ? That's the question. And so this debate is raging and, and, and the battle is now taking place. And Peter's solution, when they gather together in Jerusalem and they're having this debate, Peter stood up and his solution involved three things. First, he said in verse 7, listen to what God said. Don't you remember that God set me apart right here in this very group? God set me apart to share the gospel with the Gentiles. And he worked in them and they believed and they've been forgiven and they have life in Jesus. Remember that? Remember that God said he would do that and that that's what we're to do is to share the gospel with the Gentiles? Look, secondly, at what he did. In verse 8, he says, And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit as he did to us. Listen, God has saved them. He's given them his spirit. Listen to what God said about sharing the gospel with the Gentiles. Look at what he did. And then in verse 10, he says, And so now what you need to do is stop testing God. Stop pushing God. Stop testing him. Obey him. Why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? God has said things have changed. Why are you resisting him on that? Obey him. This yoke that was being placed on the, 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 the necks, the shoulders, the, this burden placed upon these Gentile followers of Jesus now was the Mosaic law. The law was given to show our need. Of forgiveness, to show our need of a new righteousness, to show our inability to please God, to walk without sin. The law revealed our sin to us and our deep need. The law was fulfilled by Jesus Christ. And now what's going on is, he says in verse 7, he states it so clearly, sorry, verse 11, but we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. Salvation is found only one way, and that is through grace. It is by grace you've been saved, through faith, and even that isn't from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, so that no one may boast. That's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. And so that's what Peter said. That's what Paul wrote in Ephesians. That's what Peter says here in this meeting in Jerusalem as this council gathers to decide this matter. What are we going to do with this? requiring uh, Jewish law being followed, Mosaic law being followed by Gentile believers. And he says, what's the gospel? We need to understand the gospel and be crystal clear. We are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. We do not earn it. It's not our merits. It's not our achievements. It's not our spiritual resume. And it's not, and today, well, I served in the church this long. I attended church this many times. I did. Hey, that's not earning anybody's salvation. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. So the first thing we have to do is understand the gospel. There was this confusion over what is really our message and what really are we calling people to. We have to understand the gospel. We are saved by grace alone. Then he says, don't hinder the gospel. Once we understand it, we need to move forward in a way that does not hinder the gospel. Look at verse 12. And all the assembly fell silent. And they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has, Simeon, it's another version of Simon, it's Peter. He has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. Oh, to take from them a people for his name. That is the heart of God and the purpose of God from the beginning of Scripture to the end of Scripture, from the beginning of humanity to the end of, of the world as we know it now, and then on into eternity. It's to create, to call out, to have a people for his name. I will be with them and be their God. They will be with me and be my people. That's where this is going. And this is part of the process. How God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. Verse 15. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this, I will return, and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. Therefore, my judgment, says James, is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality 
and from what has been strangled, and from blood. For from ancient generations Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. So here's what's going on. Uh, James stands up and says, hey, we've heard from Peter what he said about the being saved by grace. We've heard what he said about what God is doing amongst the Gentiles. And he says that the prophets back this up. He quotes here from Amos about God's work amongst the Gentiles in verse 16 and 17. That the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord. This was always part of God's plan that the Gentiles would be included in salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And so this is what's going on. And so the Gentiles are included. And so he says, as a result, here's what I believe we should do. We should write to the Gentile believers, and we should give them this particular list. Abstain from the things polluted by idols. Primarily, he's referring to eating the food that had been sacrificed to idols. People would come in these, these cities, in these Gentile uh, towns and cities, and they would come, and they would come to the market to buy meat. And a lot of the meat being sold was leftovers that had been offered in sacrifice at all of these pagan temples to these false gods. And once, once these sacrifices were done, they had all this meat, so they would take it to the market and sell it. And so people would buy that to eat. And they're saying, avoid that. Don't buy meat that was offered to idols. Avoid that. Uh, be free from sexual immorality. And they're talking about the cultural norm, the common practices that were going on in that day, both related to uh, the, the worship of these pagan deities, as well as in their, their common everyday practice. This was just acceptable behavior, as well as even in some of the marriage arrangements and the weird relationships they were uh, developing. You say, you know, avoid all of that. Avoid all of that. And then the third and fourth were, avoid what has been strangled, don't eat meat from an animal that's been strangled instead of killed and slaughtered. And don't eat blood. And so he's talking about these things and he says these are the restrictions we should place. Why? Because in Antioch where this was all starting, this debate had been raised, there was a large Jewish community. There were Jewish communities in most places throughout, uh, throughout Asia Minor at that time. And so that's where the believers would go and start preaching the gospel amongst the Jews, and then they would spread out to the Gentiles in those regions as well. So you have a Jewish community, and you have Jewish people who are now becoming followers of Jesus. So you have the Jewish community, you have these pagan influence on, on people's thoughts and minds and process and what they think is normal and acceptable in the culture around them. And he says, you've got to navigate through this as God's holy people. You've got to stand out as his You've been forgiven from that stuff, released from that stuff, freed from that. You need to set, be set apart now by God, to God, and for his purposes as his holy people. So to avoid confusion, do not participate in those things associated with the worship of idols. Don't conduct yourself in your sexual relationship with your spouse. Keep it to your spouse. Don't, don't conduct yourself in your, with your sexuality the way the world around you does. Don't let your culture define that for you. And, and make sure that you don't participate in anything that gives people the impression that you think idol worship is okay. That you're either involved in it or you don't care about it. You don't think it's a big deal. Avoid that. Don't create confusion. Oh, those Christians, they think the idols are fine. No. No. Those Christians, they live just like us. No. Step out. Come out and follow Christ and be separate. And so do that so, so that you'll avoid confusion and you won't put a stumbling block in front of people embracing the gospel. Don't trip them up and confuse them about what the gospel really is. Keep your life so centered on Christ that you will sacrifice things in your life in order to make sure that others clearly hear the gospel. I don't want to distract them at all. And then also, we, don't want, to, we want to avoid not just confusion, but also conflict. We've got Jews coming to Christ, Gentiles coming to Christ. We've got all this back and forth and their backgrounds and, and what are we supposed to be doing with these things. He says, don't create conflict. Don't place a stumbling block to other believers. So avoid food that's been strangled, those animals that have been strangled, and, and, and don't eat the blood. You know, don't be, provide a stumbling block to Jewish believers. Just, just don't get in their way either and trip them up. How many times in the New Testament letters are we told that? Do not do anything that will hinder the gospel or trip up a follower of Jesus and create confusion and conflict. Don't do that. Don't do it. 
And so these are not just simply random rules. These are rules that are meant to further the gospel. Remember what jo Jesus said in John chapter 13 at the Last Supper. He said, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So treat each other like that. Do not put stumbling blocks between the gospel and somebody who needs Jesus. Do not put stumbling blocks in the life of a believer who's trying to follow Jesus here. Don't trip them up in the way you live. Get, get rid of that stuff. Give it up and just walk away. Sacrifice what you need to sacrifice to make those things happen. Because this is bigger than you. This is bigger than me. This is not about us. Now it's been said that there's something very comfortable about reducing Christianity to a list of do's and don'ts whether your list comes from mindless fundamentalism or from mindless liberalism. You always know where you stand, at least, and that helps reduce anxiety. Do's and don'ts that have that has the advantage that you don't need wisdom. I just have a list. You don't have to think subtly. You don't have to make hard choices. You don't have to relate personally to a demanding and loving Lord. You don't have to live through a complicated world where you say, okay, I have to have principles from the Word of God and the Spirit of God guiding me, the brothers and sisters helping me make these choices and decisions, how do we honor God and live as His people here and now? Instead of just hand somebody a list. No, how do we process each decision? You'll never cover everything with your list. We need skills in making our choices and decisions that will honor Him. Well, the solution to this problem and confusion and conflict that was arising in the early church was first understand the gospel, have gospel clarity. We are saved by grace alone through Jesus Christ. Secondly, do not hinder the gospel. Do not hinder God's work in someone's life who needs Christ or in someone's life who has now come to Christ. Stay out of the way. Don't trip them up. And then they can continue on. And what we see here is simply be disciples who make disciples. Verse 22, we pick this up. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brothers, with the following letter. The brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the brothers who are in, of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, greetings. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words, unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instructions, it has seemed good to us having come to one accord to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols, uh, and from blood, and from what has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. So when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. And after they had spent some time, they were sent off in peace by the brothers to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. Have gospel clarity. We're saved by grace alone through Jesus Christ. Have, 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 avoid conflict. Have gospel clarity, but avoid conflict. Do not trip up a, a, an unsaved person who needs to hear the gospel. Don't confuse them. And, and don't, don't put a stumbling block before a brother or sister in Christ and, and, and start tripping them up and confusing them and causing conflict in their hearts and minds and between you. Just be disciples. Follow Jesus and go make more disciples. Keep sharing the gospel and teaching people what it means to walk with him. Clear gospel, no stumbling blocks, no confusion, no conflict. Just carry on. Use your freedom for the good of others in sharing the gospel and building them up in their walk with Christ. And notice in verse 28, For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements. That's an interesting phrase, and I just want to point this out. 
that when Christians gather together, when a church body gathers together, when church members come together uh, for decisions and choices and, and direction and all those kinds of things, their purpose is not, cannot be, should not be to determine the mind of the majority. What is the will of the majority? What do most of us want to do? That is not the point. Democracy, frankly, is not a biblical concept. All right, that's not the point. The point of believers coming together to make choices and decisions and come together on these different issues that face us is that we come together to understand, discern, and determine what is the mind of the Holy Spirit? What is his direction in this? Not what do I want, not what do you want, not do, what do most of us want. What is the Holy Spirit directing us and leading us to do to bring glory to God and good to the gospel? And those can be two very different decisions, can't they? And that's what we need to discern. All right. Well, here's the bottom line. The bottom line. If we are going to be involved in follow, as followers of Jesus in kingdom impact, if we're going to make a kingdom impact in the hearts and lives around us in our community, then we need to be absolutely clear. As verse 11 states, we are saved by grace through the Lord Jesus Christ. We are saved by grace, not works. We cannot earn God's favor. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus alone. The symbol of Christianity is a cross, not a set of scales. Did you do more good than bad? No, it, that, that's not it. It's, it's the blood of Jesus. It's forgiveness through him alone. Faith in Jesus. The grace of God poured out to us through Christ. We are saved by grace alone. Got it? Gospel clarity. The bottom line is gospel clarity and avoiding placing stumbling blocks for others. For the lost do not create confusion in their hearts and minds about what it looks like to follow Jesus because of the way you live, because of the things you indulge in, because of the things you participate in, because of the things you don't really think about or care about. Listen, we have to pay attention to how we live so that we're not making a negative impact on other people who are watching us to try and figure out this whole gospel thing. What does it look like to follow Jesus today? What does it mean to be a follower of Christ? Don't create confusion in their hearts and minds. Do not put a stumbling block in their way. And the second part of that is do not put a stumbling block in the life of other believers. If your freedom in Christ is all about you, then you do not understand your freedom in Christ. We are called in Ephesians 5 to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. We are to take our freedom and use it to serve others. We are now free to limit our choices. We're now free to limit our decisions in order to benefit other people, build them up in their walk with God, and make the gospel crystal clear. That's what we're called to do. That's the bottom line if we're going to make kingdom impact. Gospel clarity and no stumbling blocks between us and the gospel, between somebody else and the gospel, and between other believers and ourselves. We don't put stumbling blocks there. So what does that mean here at Harrow Baptist Church? We've had questions lately from newer people and people, people talking to us. How, how do I join? How do I become a part of that church family, your, your the church body there locally at Harrow? What's this process? Well, it's very simple, really. First, we have to make sure that you have faith in Jesus Christ, that you understand who he is, that he is the Son of God, he's the Lord of all, that you understand that he is the Redeemer, the Rescuer, he's the only Savior we have. You have to understand what he did. He came and lived a sinless life here. He died taking our place, taking upon himself the judgment of God for our rebellion, so that he could then give us his righteousness. He rose again that he might also offer us not just forgiveness, but also eternal life. That's what he's done. But we have to understand that forgiveness is only in his name. That we need to repent, turn our backs 180 degrees on doing things our own way and surrender to him. You are Lord, I'm not. We will do things your way, not my way. I am trusting in you, not anything I've done. I'm not bringing you my resume to say, here, will this help in my standing before God? I'm simply coming to you depending on you. Is your faith in Christ? If you have placed your faith in Jesus, then the second step is, have you been baptized? Have you been baptized? And we understand from Romans 6 what the picture of baptism is, being, being buried and dying to sin and self and being raised to new life, just as Christ was buried and rose again. 
That's the picture. That, that's why we baptize the way we do. You come and be baptized. It's obedience to one of the very first and most basic commands of Jesus. Believe and be baptized. So come and be baptized as a way of identifying with him and with his people, as a way of obedience to him and showing that he has the lordship over my life. Faith in Jesus, baptism, and then membership. Why do we have church membership today? Well, I don't think church membership is biblical in terms of a chapter and verse. We have to have church membership in a formal setting the way that we've got it today. But, but we've got it for a few reasons. One is for accountability. How many churches were there in Antioch? Well, they gathered the believers together in Antioch because there was one church. Uh, now there's a church on every corner. People can just fade out of one church and fade into another and then fade out of there and fade into somewhere else or something goes on in my life and somebody confronts me with it. I'm going to run and take my ball and go home and go play over there. All those kind of things can happen. And so church membership gives us an, an accountability that says, I am connecting here with these brothers and sisters. They are the ones that I am going through life with. We are learning together and growing to become more like Jesus together. We're reaching into our community together. We're serving one another. We're building one another up. This is where I'm at. It's accountability that way. There's also accountability now in the way I live. I have brothers and sisters who know me because we worship together. We study together. We pray together. We serve together. They know me. And when there's something in my life that's not adding up with scripture, they're in a position to come alongside and say, Steve, we got a problem. Brother, this is sin. You need to repent of that and we'll walk with you. Help, we'll help you, whatever it takes to, to walk out of that and let's go. We need that accountability in how we live with each other. It holds us accountability in terms of our teaching. We need members here so that there's an accountability to the church leaders for, for what is being taught. We need to know who is teaching our children, our people, our teenagers and our adults here. We need to know who's teaching and what they're teaching. And also, of course, for our responsibilities to serve and to be involved in ministry as we plug into each other's lives and ministry together. So we do membership this way because of accountability. We also have a former mem formal membership structure because of charity law, frankly. And, and, and we're, we're, a, we're a registered charity uh, as a church, and, and we hold property together and all those kinds of things. And so we need to have a formal structure in place where we have a group of people who can meet together occasionally to affirm the decisions of our leaders and to help seek the spirits leading together as we look for our choices and decisions moving forward. So the question really this morning is this, are you clear on the gospel? Do you understand that we're saved by grace through Jesus Christ alone? And have you responded to him? Have you surrendered your life to him and say, this isn't about me trying to earn God's favor. This is about me surrendering to Jesus and saying, you are Lord and you are the one who has sacrificed yourself for us and for me. Oh, thank you for paying for my sin and offering me your righteousness. Have you surrendered to Jesus? Have you embraced the gospel? Uh, secondly, have you been baptized? Take that step of obedience. It's simply a command of Jesus. Come and be baptized. We'd love to work with you on that. And then join join the church, come and join and be a part of what God's doing here as we serve, as we learn, as we mature in Christ together, reaching into our community. Friends, I urge you, let's make sure that we are crystal clear on the gospel and that we do not place any stumbling blocks and do not hinder God's work in someone else's life, whether it's so that they can encounter the the gospel and Jesus Christ, or whether it's another believer, so that we don't trip them up as they learn what it means to walk with Jesus. Let's not, in the sake for the sake of feeling free, trip up anybody else or get in the way of what God wants to do in our hearts, in our church family, and in our community. Amen? The gospel is clear. So is the call. So is the call to live in such a way that we build up brothers and sisters, and share Christ with others. May the Lord continue his great work in us and through us and among us as we follow him this way together.